Soccer Summit. Um, we're going to take just a couple moments to let everyone get in the room and then we'll get started. We're in for a very special treat today. And let us know where you're coming in from. We want to know where everybody's zooming. Yeah, put it in the chat, please, where you're, where you're zooming from. All right. Get started here. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. America Scores combines soccer, poetry, and service learning for after school programs for underserved youth. So we appreciate everyone taking the time to help um, give us a little more exposure. Um, also, love to thank our partners, um, Women in Soccer, free membership. So, everyone listening should definitely join. Um, we'll put, I'll put the link in the chat. And then goal five has been an awesome partner too. Somebody in today's audience is going to win a giveaway of product from goal five and we'll notify you after. So thank you so much. And we have four amazing women here and I am going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Angela, who is going to um, charm us with a poem and then um, she'll take over the round table. So thank you so much and enjoy. Thanks, Alicia. So I quickly wanna give uh, a shout out to, of course, America Scores Bay Area because they are putting on, we are putting on the summit and there is no better way to welcome everybody to a scores event than with a poem. And today I'm gonna do one by Isabel. She's in fourth grade and she attends Moscone Elementary. It's called Athlete's Paradise. Soft grass and a single ball sway in the wind while parents shout and cheer to their daughters and sons. Itchy shin guards and long socks move as if cheering me on. As the cool water responds to my body, the sweat drip kisses my temples and whispers a sweet champion song to my ears. Pen and markers dance with the paper to appreciate our fellow players. Friday's hot sun brings blue skies and loud laughter. Rainbow shirts and alligator shoes fill the fields. Friday soccer, is where you'll find an athlete's paradise. No, that is, well, snap to Isabel. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. My name is Angela Bailey. I am a member of the America Scores Bay Area crew, but I also am the president of the Golden Gate Women's Soccer League here in the Bay Area. And I'm so excited to be on this panel today with these lovely ladies who also run different soccer organizations for women. So we're gonna have just a conversation. Uh, we'll start by introducing ourselves and talking a bit about our leagues and why they started and where we're at you know, during these crazy times of COVID um, and, and how you can go about starting your own soccer league in your region if uh, you can ask these, these, uh, these experts themselves because I think a lot of women here have put together an amazing group of members in their organizations. So Anna, why don't you kick us off? Uh, and then we can just uh, jump in when you're done. Okay, uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Anna Siedzik and I am the outreach director for the Eastern Massachusetts Women's Soccer League, which is based around the Boston area. So New Englanders here. Uh, the league was started in the early 70s. So it's one of the older women's leagues in the country. Um, and it started at a time where there really weren't a lot of women's leagues at all or women playing. So um, I've got to give some proud homage to the those who came before us. Um, so the league is about, oh, I don't know. It depends on the season, the year, but anywhere between 30 to 40 teams, 45 teams. It depends on, uh, you know, just overall interest all within the 495 belt. So if you know Boston, that's sort of the, you know, the hub around and uh, anywhere between, you know, 1500 to 2000 players, anywhere between ages 18 to mid seventies, uh, we cross the gamut and the level is from the top level, you know, either current or former D1, D2, D3 players. So pretty competitive if you're at the top. Uh, and then all the way down, we have five divisions and the lower division is either for completely recreational players that have never played all ages or people who are just older and do not appreciate a slide tackle the way that other people might. So um, we try to offer a really robust offering, all ages, all levels, levels of competition, and we play three seasons a year, spring, summer, and fall. Awesome, Anna, thank you. Brandy, do you wanna go next? 
Sure. So I'm Brandy Mitchell and I run San Diego Soccer Women. And while I'm not a league, uh, I'm an organization that basically gives out information um, about the leagues in San Diego County for women, uh, specifically recreational soccer. And that can be from ages 18 up, but I tend to specialize in ages 30 and over. We have women playing into their 80s here in San Diego County. And that's actually true around the country that there are uh, teams that are over 70 division um, that have some 80 year olds playing. And then of course, as we go down to the younger ages, there are plenty of opportunities to play locally and then even nationally we see some great representation and i've been working for the past couple of years really just through social media through my website uh, through some of these types of calls to make sure that there's awareness uh, both between men and women within the soccer industry that, that there are women who want to be playing who may be coming back into the sport or who may have you know never stopped and want to continue playing into older ages and then women who um you know, maybe for the very first time in their 50s or 60s, they want to get started. And the same is true in their 20s and 30s that they may or may not have played as a kid, but want to get started. And, and that's something that I think is really um, being missed. It's true that in San Diego County, we have leagues that started in the 70s, thanks to Title IX. Uh, we had women who saw their daughters playing for the first time or, you know, saw that growth and realized that this could be an opportunity for women to join in. So starting for that many years ago, we have these leagues that developed around the country. And it's just a matter now of kind of watching that growth happening. And it feels like we're a little bit of a, of a stalled moment that we don't see a whole lot of new leagues forming in the United States, but at the same time, internationally, we're, we're just now getting some representation of women at older ages, um, specifically in parts of Europe. And, and that's creating opportunity for women from the United States and from Canada to travel abroad um, and, and meet up with these women who are getting started, um, again, back into the sport or for the first time. So San Diego Soccer Women, it, again, is it's not one specific league. It's really me just trying to create this bridge and then all these connections and a network for women to, to you know, again, either grow or offer something for the first time. Awesome, Brandy. That's, yeah, creating connections. There's, there's such a big community. We're learning that with the summit. So really excited that the four of us at least are connecting and we hope to grow this. Um, Callie, please tell us about your league. Hello, I'm Callie. I'm the president of GASA, which was formerly Georgia, actually, I'm sorry, Greater, At uh, Greater Atlanta Women's Soccer Association, which is now Georgia Amateur Women's Soccer Association. We're getting bigger. Um, we, I've been playing in our league for over 20 years, but our league is over 35, 40 years old. And we also, like everyone else, we have four divisions, D1, D2, D3, and Masters, um, which is over 30, which we're looking at. But I mean, just basically we're here to make sure all women have an opportunity to play, no matter what your traffic is in regards to your age, your skill set. Um, we just really want to make sure that we cater to every single woman that's out there. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, I could go on with everyone else, but I think, yeah, I wanted to get on to questions and anything else that you guys want to know about us but yeah that's pretty much us that's great and and just because we were talking before you your league is still playing right now we right? are still playing as a matter of fact um sunday was the last makeup game for our 11 v 11 so our d1 women's team had a makeup game and um our winter season starts in january knock on wood and there's a tournament um this saturday so yeah our leagues are going strong um we're with you in spirit <laughs> protocols in place yeah. <laughs> with we're, we're. painstakingly we have a lot of COVID protocols in place um I'm really excited and happy to say that we got through our fall season doing 11 v 11 and 7 v 7 with no COVID issues incidences or anything yeah. like that so yay for us bad bad knock on wood <laughs> you know so hopefully with that being said that we're going to start to see and when our winter registration is now open we're starting to see more numbers come back because people are starting to feel more comfortable in the fact that we are doing what's necessary to keep them as safe as possible. And at the same time, get out there away from your children and your husband, your significant other, so you can breathe, you know, get your mind right. So that's <laughs> mental health yeah. is yeah. what we're no. all about right now, <laughs> mental and physical that's health. Totally. Yeah. I think for most of us in a normal time, soccer keeps us in the, like away Same. from crazy. And right now, yes. Um, Brandy and Anna, are you is, are your leagues going right now, or what are you doing if they're not going? Any alternatives that you guys have found? Um, 
so our league, uh, we, we are not going as a league. Um, we had several rounds of board meetings where we really tried hard to think about doing it, hold the teams. And ultimately, um, you know, here in the Northeast, COVID hit us harder in, you know, different ways at different times. And then the weather is not our friend uh, in New England. So, uh, yeah, so we are not operating as a league. That was too hard to work. However, we do have a couple sort of groups that are related to the league. Um, and they're more of our travel team. So there's a group called the Mass Spirit. I want to give a shout out to Mass Spirit. It's a big travel team. They've played a lot of tournaments. And so they've been doing some training sessions as well um, in smaller groups, heavily protocoled, you know, heavily masked. And then another group, which is also sort of related to travels, are the Bay State Breakers. And, you know, they a lot of women play that. So uh, in smaller groups, some people have been doing some work, but the league itself just couldn't get the logistics to work, get the comfort level up. So we are optimistic that we kick this virus and that we'll have a robust spring. And, you know, it's been hard for us. So not right now, but we're hopeful. Okay. We hope for you too and for us, I understand. Brandy? Yeah. Here in California, you know well, we, so what, what happened here in California is that in March, all adult field permits uh, were not allowed. And that's continued this entire time. And the way our leagues run, you do, you know, through a parks and rec department, through whether it's city or county land, you have to get a permit in order to play. So all leagues have been stopped completely. We definitely have small groups of women who will get together. Uh, I go out to a field, require masks the entire time of hand sanitizer sitting at every corner. And, and then we, we do social distancing. So we talk a lot about defending space. Uh, not getting getting up close to each other. We don't even wear shin guards because you're not supposed to be that close to kick each other in the shins. So we just do some movement. We do drills a lot more than anything else. And, and it's actually interesting because this is an opportunity that was created uh, at this point for women who are more entry level, women who are beginners to come and try the sport out in a way that, you know, I wouldn't have been running these kind of casual training kick around sessions uh, without COVID happening. And, and partly because I was busy playing all my games and, and I think, you know, so for us, again, at this point, either women aren't playing at all, or they've just found some really casual way to, to out in the open space, get some playing time in with, with a couple other women. Thanks. I'm glad there's some playing time going on. We, um, at the GGWSL or Golden Gate Women's Soccer League, which um, has been around since uh, 1977. So there was a group of women who got together and wanted to play, put an ad in the newspaper, started a league, uh, eventually joined CSAN or USASA. Um, and now we are up to around 40 teams. It, it, it fluctuates every, every season, but yeah, we have a fall, a spring, around a thousand members, um, a ton of camaraderie. You know, there's, of course, that's just playing the sport is beautiful, but I think uh, we've you know, if you ask most of the players why they play, of course, it's for the beautiful game, but there's teams that are that are like families, you know, and the importance of keeping that support group, that social network, um, you know, is 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 actually been very um, uh, just frustrating for those of us who are trying to run the league because we know, you know, there are other ways to get fitness. There are other there are drills and things you can do with the ball. There's nothing of course like the game but but really what we're just trying to figure out is how do we keep the social connection you know how do we give these women who have made fam like second families and and many of them come together themselves but it's just not the way it used to be um, especially when we have you know again across the country but here in san diego seeing a population of ages 60s and 70s who would have no question every single week they had at least one game that that was an opportunity to meet with these women that they may have been playing with for 20 years. Some of them yes. had known each other since childhood. So it's especially that double demographic of, you know, that you have quarantine, you're having that isolation, but also you're an age group that it's not quite as easy to, to do this kind of fitness activities on your own. Um, you're a higher risk when you do try to get out and, and have some opportunity of exposure. So yes. it's, it's been interesting balancing that also. Yes. Yeah. Well, and Angela, you touched on something that we talked about a lot too, is sort of understanding the psychology of an older player, mm -hmm. especially, you know, a moderate to mid competitive player is um, when you lose that, you have to unpack, you know, why do women start playing when they're much older? Why do they continue playing when you have all these logistical challenges, work, family, travel, aging knees, you know, all of that. So, you know, in our league, we talk a lot about, you know, sort of getting into what motivates someone to keep playing and try to touch all those points. But what you're saying now is, is 
no one's out here playing women's recreational soccer because someone's, you know, God forbid, paying to watch it or you have fans. Like every so often we do get some crowds and every so often we get spicy games, but Mm -hmm. you're playing around this pure love, you know, Mm -hmm. for the sport or to stay healthy. But as you said, there's a lot of ways to stay healthy. So you have to tap into like, why do women want to keep playing this amazing game? That's hard. I mean, soccer is a hard game. And um, we talk about that a lot as a motivator and really trying to make our offering something that people want to do, which, you know, we can get into the logistics later, but I do think COVID has been really hard for teams and, you know, my particular teammates. Um, yeah, we are a sisterhood, you know, we, we got each other's backs and it's been hard to not have that mm-hmm. in this moment where you really want it. And, and for so many people, um, sport is a release, it's mental health, it's fitness, but it's also sort of, you know, especially for older players, it's a, I don't want to say a triumph of the soul. It's a little cheesy, but it's sort of like, it's proof that you can keep going, you know, and it's a motivator. And now all of a sudden it's been taken away. And it's like, that's, that was part of their identity. So I think that's going to be a huge issue um, as we rebuild coming out of this to really touch on that social emotional health for players who are not doing it. They're not playing for a scholarship. They're not playing because they're going to be on the national team. That's, I mean, if that's why you're playing recreational soccer, you're probably in the wrong league. So <laughs> no offense, but like, you got to be real. So you yeah. have to sort of like, look at the motivation and, and meet people where they are. Yeah, uh, very, uh, very well said, Anna. I got to give up. I, I feel like there would be a couple women in our league who play at the premier level in the WPSL who would say, well, maybe one day they will. So um, yeah, the majority, 99.7% are out here because we love it and we love our teams. And we love being, you know, a part of a team for sure. So, um, and that was really well said. You touched on the, the psychological part of it, but also um, like as folks who run leagues, um, I know Callie, you're still running the league. Um, it sounds like you guys have had to take precautions. Um, what, what, how has COVID logistically affected um, your guys' playing opportun- opportunities? And I mean, that's obvious, but also how you organize. What's next? What are you guys doing to to plan? Well, I mean, when this first hit and we were given the green light to go pretty much, you know, go into phases and figure out where we, you know, we sat down, um, we started using some of our resources, some of our players in our league are, you know, work with the CDC. Um, So that was a plus. Um, Of course, I have people on my board as an attorney. So we all pretty much sat down, you know, you have to tap into your resources to, to make sure you're making sure everyone's safe. That's the first priority. How can we do this safely? you know, without just, hey, let's go, let's get out there because you don't want to make the situation worse. Um, so the first thing we decided to do now in fall and spring, we do 11 v 11. Um, summer and winter, we do 7 v 7. And that's um, just across the board. What we decided to do this fall because of, to your point, the age demographic, as far as it being the older you are, you know, you are basically kind of, you know, you're one of the people who are high risk. We offered our D3, which tends to have, you know, older um, players and our masters, the opportunity to either play 11 v 11 or 7 v 7. Um, so we made it smaller fields. We tried to accommodate them. And so we weren't going to, you know, change, you know, we do the regu- you know, reg- you know, regulation and so on. All of that just kind of went out the window. We just want to get everyone out there to play. <clears throat> mm-hmm. The first thing we actually did, believe it or not, was a tournament. We called it the COVID Welcome Back Tournament. And that was basically, I don't want to say we use our players as guinea pigs, but we need to see if we could do this. Um, and we also wanted to see how many people were interested in coming back. Um, and it was great. Almost everyone, like, it was a lot of players that came back. Um, it was a lot of time um, doing the tournament. It basically, we had tables set up, separate tables for check-in. You had to have a wristband if you were a player, wristband if you were a ref, wristband if you were a guest. You had to go through all the COVID questionnaires. You know, you had to get your temperature checked. So if there anybody from um, um, any government officials or anyone drove by, they could honestly see what our rules were. They could see that if you didn't have a wristband, there was no reason for you to be in that park. It told us that you did not come through our COVID protocols or anything along the lines of that. Um, so that was our first thing to see if we could actually do it and see how the players would adhere to our rules and regulations. And everyone, because they wanted to play, they were for it. So we decided to move forward, kept D1 and D2, 11 v 11, and we moved uh, our D3 and Masters to 7 v 7, one field for uh, those two divisions. 
and which made it easier. I mean, if you wanted to pick up a player, so on and so forth, they were all in one spot, one space. And it, you know, uh, so we also have, like I said, a COVID tracking. We use Sports Connect and um, awesome news. I'm not sure if anyone also uses it. We use it for our website. But the cool thing about Sports Connect is that they have a team manager app, which they just recently started to do this, which I wish we have known, before, you know, I wish they did it earlier because we were using paper and we we're trying not to use so much paper, but for our COVID tracking. Um, initially, our one of our COVID protocols was, you know, you had our, <clears throat> we had our, you know, game card and we also had our COVID tracker, which was all the seat questions from CDC, your temperature, all of that had to be done before you even set foot on, um, you know, onto the field. You know, each uh, park, they all had their own, some of them didn't, believe it or not, had COVID guidelines that you need to follow, but we basically sent everyone our COVID guidelines and they were okay with that. Um, so now that Sports Connect slash Team Manager has this app, which if, you, if you're, you know, a captain, and you know, you try to make things easier for your captains because they do enough as it is. Oh, yes. They can actually just go to the app, have their players answer this COVID questionnaire, just go right down the list and um, tells you tells the captain whether they can play or not. Captain two clicks sends that um, Excel sheet to me and or you know to their um, respective VP. And um, we have the temperatures on the game card next to that person. So that, that was basically something for us legally as a league to cover ourselves and to also track or trace any player that may come down with um, symptoms or have any issues along the lines of that. So um, that was really the only change that we made to our fall season. We honestly didn't um, make any other changes outside of the COVID protocols and changing the format for um, those that were at high risk. And that was pretty much all we did. So I'm grateful to say that we didn't have as many as we normally have had, obviously, but, you know, to still have over 300 women still sign up and come out and play, I was like, yes, I get, yeah. it. I get it. I'm one of you. So yeah, uh, um, it yeah, took, a no, yeah. it took a lot of reaching out to the resources that you have, but it's worth it to you out there and you watch women of all ages that are playing, so... That's awesome. So I'm getting a, my six-year-old is <laughs> saying hello. Um, hang on one second. Um, so um, Brandy, did you, yeah, please. I want to, I want to just like leave the COVID conversation just for a minute, because I think there's so much, I'm assuming a lot of our audience is actually involved in women's leagues already. So, you know, each state is so different, each, each region, like the comfort level, but also all the regulation. So I think everyone's navigating that in the best way that they can. But looking at this long term, uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, kind of finding this spot of time that we can think more and start to network. Like not everybody has more time than usual because of COVID, but for some reason, because of not having our own soccer games individually, like some of us as organizers, um, that I, I really do want to reach out to everyone who's watching right now, whether it's live or in replays, and I've, I've checked in with women in soccer and I'm hoping this will all come through, but I believe they're gonna be offering a forum. And within that forum, I believe on a Slack platform, um, I'm hoping to open forums specifically to women's recreational soccer. We do already have um, a Facebook uh, kind of group, like a private group that a few women um, had started and it has grown. I believe we're close to a thousand members in there. So if you are either involved with women's soccer because you're a player and this is all recreational, or because you're you're part of the system or both, then please look for the adult women's soccer Facebook page, join in there. Uh, and, and again, moving forward, looking at how the women in soccer platform might give us a place. And what I'd like to see is that we actually have a form specifically for league or organizers. And so individual players can have a space also, but I think the league organizers, because there has been just so much separation over the years, you know, I'm fairly new to the concept of women's leagues, just you know, being in my 40s, this is kind of, I just got, got started in women's leagues, gotten started when I was in my 20s, my late 20s. But even then I was just playing and didn't really have a role as far as involvement. So it was later into my 30s and early 40s that I realized this is an actual network that can be joined together. But right now, each league seems to operate, even really large leagues, they seem to operate really without input and feedback from other leagues in other areas. And I feel like at this point, that's going to be really valuable 
and it's available and easy to us. I mean, again, we've learned through COVID that all these Zoom calls, all this opportunity that we don't have to be in person in order to really have these conversations and connect. So um, again, whether it's through the Facebook page right now or once Women in Soccer has that platform available for us, let's make sure we, we reach out to one another I know I email out, so as San Diego Soccer Women, I email out to leagues to let them know I have a tournament listing on my website of every tournament I know of that provides uh, age 30 and older leagues specifically, or sorry, tournaments specifically that include women. Uh, and that's something, again, that I'm offering, like, let's just make sure the information is out there publicly so we can share. A lot of us know about the Masters Games. Um, that's kind of an organization underneath the Olympic Games. And, and some I find that there are still leagues and teams who had never heard that there are, you know, are these actual, you know, every few years there are these massive international events specifically with women's soccer competition. So that's one thing, again, just by providing this information and all of us kind of checking in with each other. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say I saw a comment in the chat that uh, one thing that I've been working on and I know has happened in a few parts of the country is walking soccer. And that is, it's, it's new to the concept because for us here in the United States, we really started out with soccer. My understanding is as a youth sport, it doesn't have the history of, you know, being a, a man sport. And all of a sudden now women are trying to take over. It's actually known to be a youth sport. Men are obviously involved. And then women kind of lastly are considered after that. So, so our identity as women's soccer players is so much roped into standard soccer, but, but I think we all have to look ahead. And I say we being one of the players that I do want to continue to play into my 60s and 70s. But because as girls, we now, our generation, has we've played our entire childhoods. The risk of wear and tear, the risk of injury is actually more so than for the women who started to play in their 30s and 40s and 50s and who are now in their you know 50s 60s 70s that, that their bodies actually had a little bit easier start to it all even if they didn't have the skill level their body didn't already have the knee injuries and the hip wear and tear and um, you know even back and neck issues things like that so ankles so i think we have to keep in mind that transforming the game whether it's smaller sided working on you know walking soccer opportunities that we have to have a bigger view of being inclusive and I think it's all the leagues are going to benefit by doing that. So I'll pass it off to someone else now. Yeah, well said, Brandy. You touched on some things that um, that that I think would be good for us to speak on. First and foremost, women in soccer who are amazing. And you're right, that is that is a platform and will be a way for all of us to connect, regardless of what we do. Um, in the game, playing the game, organizing the game, men, women, I'm uh, sorry, just women, uh, but all different ages and such. And uh, for anybody listening, make sure to attend their session tomorrow at 1 p.m. The founders will be on. That will be a great place to share your, like, your hopes and dreams for what women in soccer can be, what we can make that community. So get on tomorrow and speak with them directly and let them know what, what your thoughts are. Brandy, you have some great, like, let's get a platform for women league organizers. That would be great. Um, and then to the walking soccer. Um, yes, I know that's something that we've been trying to promote. Our CSAN uh, partners have been wanting to get this into, um, you know, make sure that the community is aware. Um, as a person in the chat said, this is something that it's an alternative that we could possibly look into when we're coming back to the game or now if enough precautions are taken, um, depending on what your league allows. Um, we actually tried foot golf uh, with America Scores did a tournament. Um, some of our members for Golden Gate actually did a foot golf uh, yeah. mini tournament. And so that is a great way to be on the green, kicking a ball with, you know, less of your team, but some of your team. So there definitely are alternatives, right? It right. is not all bleak. Uh, thank you, Brandy, for reminding us that. Yes. Um, well, and the but, thing that's interesting about walking football or walking soccer is that it actually opens up more international opportunity. We're seeing in the UK, in parts of Europe, in South America, and parts of Asia even, that there are women's soccer teams. And again, because of cultural issues and also age that, you know, for the over 50 crowd, that's specifically what they're targeting is let's bring women into the game, but it's allowed in the walking level. And I'm assuming that over time, it's actually gonna move that there will be more standard soccer for women over 30, over 40, over 50 um, outside of the US and Canada. But for now, for women who do wanna travel and play, that learning that game, and again, for older ages, learning how to adjust to walking soccer is actually gonna create more opportunity for us, so. Right, 
right later. And then um, please, Anna, Kelly, jump in. Don't let Brandy and I take over the conversation. Well, I was, I, I, will, I will jump in. I feel like there's a couple of things I want to say. Um, and I think Brandy is underselling herself a little bit. Those of us who are in the Cool Kids Club, you know, Brandy is like a super connector in the women's recreational side of it. So I can't, um, I can't say that enough. You know, Brandy was the one who invited me to this panel and has, you know, introduced some of the new things I did because I think, uh, so shout out to Brandy, like honestly, just say thank you, thank take the credit, it's okay. Um, but what I want to say is one of the things that's becoming really obvious to me in all these different um, new focus groups, women in soccer, women in football, football, women united, like there's a lot of different flavors of advocacy building. There's a lot of leagues, even within this panel, we have four different leagues. Uh, Brandy won't even call herself a league, but she's kind of a league. Like there's a lot of ways to do it. So I think one of the points I would want to make to people listening, especially if you're in a league that's trying to grow or if you think about starting to grow is women's soccer is not a monolith. And I feel like that that's a really important thing that, you know, sometimes you feel a lot of top-down pressure that has to be high quality. And that's not true. Sometimes you feel a lot of bottom-up pressure. It's like, well, anything you do on the field is okay. And I think the reality is that we have players in our league and across the country and around the world for whom all of that spectrum is true, right? And so one of the things I think is important to resist is this idea that um, it's not okay to be competitive. And I'm thinking in particular about our competitive travel teams of older players. And, you know, sometimes I'm a little too kumbaya. I'm like, oh, just get on the field. Anything you do is great. And they're like, I want to play a game. I want to play a real game. I want someone who could take a proper corner kick, you know? Like, and I think it's important to legitimize also, it's okay to be competitive. It's okay to just want to run around. It's okay to do it for fun. It's okay to, you know, like there is a whole spectrum of what women's soccer means. And I think that that's really important to people building these platforms. Cause I personally feel a lot of pressure sometimes to try to conform even within this allegedly non-conforming space. We still put up barriers like, well, were you a former player, college pro, whatever. I'm like, no. Did you coach? Well, yeah, but you know, like there are all these sort of criteria. And I, I feel like if we can get to the point where we can just embrace each other, wherever we are, that's great. But logistically, and I'll put on my league manager hat, league you know, person, and I know our board president, Dee Woolley is on this call. So she's going to appreciate when I say this, all that talk sounds great, but to make it logistically viable, you have to have enough teams at a certain level in a certain geographic distance to actually make it flow. So even though you might have a really fired up group of 12, 75 year old women who wanna play walking soccer, that might not be enough to launch it, you know, or you might have um, a lot of teams in the middle that are pretty competitive, but you know, part of the fun is not necessarily playing the same people over and over. So as a league, we've often struggled with, do we divide by age? Do we divide by ability? Do we divide by geography? Because the reality is that we have jobs and families and other stuff. So driving four hours to a soccer match, you know, that has limited appeal for some people. So I think it's important to then put all of what I said before about the awesomeness of opportunity into a practical framework. So as a league organizer, you've got to think, if I want to make this fun so that people are willing to spend time and money, you know, because this doesn't happen just through like good intentions, like it costs money. So how are you going to put that together? And I think that's a real capacity issue as the international women's soccer field, so to speak, starts to really grow and expand is thinking about where are the logistical choke points and try to build concentrated capacity. And then also just recognizing as Brandy's alluded to, and we all have, um, you know, some, of, some people who play soccer are really competitive and that's what they want. They don't necessarily want to travel. They want to stay close to home for whatever reason. Some people are not very good soccer players, myself included, but I'm a soccer advocate. I will travel anywhere to play mediocre soccer because it's about advocacy or quality. Um, and so, you know, and then again, everything in between new players, old players, and I think the generational shift from what Title IX did for women in the 40s, in their 40s now, their 50s now, versus kids today. You know, again, I'm a, I'm a social historian, so I always think about like, where's the framework of people coming, but that's important to building it because if you want to market it, you have to figure out why are these people here, what's going to keep them coming, what's going to make them love it, um, and that's really important, and I think touching on all those, those sort of different features of what makes women in soccer, we're not monoliths just because we're all 
women or identify as women doesn't mean anything just because we all play soccer that means a lot of different things too i want to add on just really quickly about advocacy and and this is so much the direction that i ended up heading without meaning to so a couple of years ago in 2018 I took a group group of women to Norway to go to this very famous field um, in the northern the northern area, and what ended up happening is I just naturally ended up seeking out some partnerships where it wasn't I didn't ask for money I wasn't asking for anything from them except I wanted to use some of their messaging and at that time the the uh, Global Goals World Cup was the name of the organization and they specifically uh, talked about how the United Nations sustainable development goals, there are 17 total, how, how those can actually be reached using opportunity like sport, using soccer specifically, and through women. And, and so for me, that worked, and I continue that messaging about the United Nations, um, the SDGs is what they're called, or the, or the global goals. And, and I think that's something for each of the adult leagues, like this concept of advocacy goes along with the concept of credibility. And as Anna was talking about, I mean, I know I find, and, and Callie, I'm sure it's similar there, that, and, and uh, uh, Angela, obviously with you, that we as women le women's leagues often do not get the very best fields we don't even get the the mediocre fields we sometimes get the worst fields we get the referees who are least qualified um you know the time slots are the very last choice and part of it is the league managers themselves choosing to step on step up on behalf of women and behalf on behalf of these soccer players to say we are going to demand more and make sure that the quality is out there so that the women who are spending their time and we already talked about that you know, through all of the responsibilities that we see globally that women tend to take on more than men, uh, that, that we're choosing to spend our time out there on the soccer field, how can that experience be as valuable to, to us as it is to the people around us who are real, you know, who are the, the kids who are seeing us as mentors, the, the gender equality issues that end up because of us playing soccer. Like, how can we bring that all together to make sure we're representing as advocates but also, you know, giving the experience the quality that it deserves. So again, I want to make sure that anyone listening, if you are involved in a league, take sponsorship more seriously, you know, ask for things, don't be afraid, don't feel like we have to be the last in line just because we are less serious, right? Like, oh, we're, we're just women who want to go out and play. We do have value. There's so much more to what we're doing and uh, reaching out, reaching up, you know, pulling each other up, all of that is something that league managers, uh, league directors, team managers that we all can be doing. Uh, and just a quick add on to that is this concept of, um, you know, I know a few women here in San Diego who, who created organizations on their own that ended up helping the community that were soccer related. And obviously we have America Scores. I know there are those um, locations nationwide that also choosing to bring some kind of charitable experience into this the experience of playing soccer you have a valuable network of women who are willing to do something have all the skills we need what else can we be doing beyond just playing so um to kind of piggyback i'm the listener as you guys can probably tell i listen to everything that everyone is saying and i'm like uh-huh mm -hmm, okay interesting um so i'm going to go to anna and then i'm going to go back to brandy um a couple of comments that you guys made um, Anna, I agree with you in regards to, you know, making sure as far as your league, um, if you're already an established league, if you are trying to grow your league or keep, you know, maintain, how do you make sure that you're making um, every single player, you know, how do you, to your point where you're like, do you do it by age, do you do it by skill set? You know, personally, we do it by both. We do it by skill set. And like I said, we have our masters, which we do by age. But um, at the end of the day, you act, you are catering to everyone. You can't basically just say, if you're going to do it this way, you're going to do it that way. Because ultimately, as we spoke earlier, if you are not bringing in that younger player, then you are not going to grow your league regardless. Um, you've got to, that's going to build your league no matter what, because as we all know, everyone ages out. It, it is what it is. That's the cycle of life. We can't help it. Um, but you have to get the, that younger player in. Um, one of the things that, you know, they are competitive. You don't always have, you know, those 19, 20 year olds that are uber competitive, you do have some that are wreck, but most of them, if you're doing it, and this is something that we're working on, if you're working with those um, youth leagues, you know, those girls graduate, where are they playing next? Do they have, you know, do you, have you built those relationships with those youth clubs? So when those young ladies graduate out of the U19, where are they playing? You know, do you have anything set up so you can already, you know, okay, so now you have a team here. You already have a home there. Are those the young ladies that are already in your league talking to those young ladies, you know, who are on the rise? Are they developing those relationships? Are you cultivating it? So um, a, a situation within your league. So everyone word of mouth is saying, hey, come here. Hey, it's super competitive. Hey, 
I have a team for you that's not competitive. Hey, you can be 18 and go to regionals and ball out. Hey, you can be 18 and just chill over here and go have a beer or wine or whatever after, you know, after your game with your friends. You just have to make sure that, you know, which is why we do so more via skill level than we do age because it's really up to that player and how they want to play the game because competitive, super fun for some, not competitive, super fun. I think I'm kind of right there in the middle, quite honestly, because, you know, recovery is a different story. Um, <laughs> you know, you get out there, you can play all day, but, you know, at the end of the day, that can be um, very, very painful. But that's one of the things in regards to, now I'm going to go to Brandy as far as, you know, you made a comment about uh, being, you know, advocating for the things that you want and for the refs and things of that nature. Um, I can honestly and sincerely say it's not about patting you on, patting us on the back or anything along the lines of that. There, I don't think that, you know, when we approach people about fields or anything along the lines of that, we don't say we're, uh, you know, we want, we're playing soccer, this is our league, what field space do you have? It's not about whether it's women or not, it's about money. This is how we're paying for the field. How much is it? It's at the end of the day, you know, they can say whatever, but if you have money and you're willing to take that field space and you can sign those contracts, that helps. So that sponsorships and things of that nature are extremely helpful because at the end of the day, green always speaks. We all know this. It's, it's a business. I mean, even if it's a nonprofit, but you have to have, be able to say, I'm taking this field space from these guys. They're trying to get their stuff together. That's not the, I don't have anything to do with that. I can kind of sign this contract right now. Let's go. So yeah. that, and if I'm, I'm not mistaken, I have to check and see, but from my understanding, I believe at least here in Georgia, um, our D1, if, you are, if our refs do D1 games, they can be assessed from our women's games, which in turn has more, we have, we're getting better refs because they would rather ref a women's D1 game all day, every day than a men's competitive game because it's just less extra for lack of a better word. That's a great way to say it. <laughs> yeah. It's just less yeah. extra. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so you can be assessed at these and, you know, so you can start mm -hmm. switching up. With women's D1, and you have to make sure your assigners know that. Um, it's about networking and knowing who you're working with and letting them know, you know, when we did our tournament, I can make a phone call, I can talk to these people because I've cultivated these relationships. I make sure that we have these conversations and I make it so, yes, we are that women's league, but we are, they all know we're playing. You know, when there's co ed teams, I have lots of my young ladies play in co ed. Lots of guys know. I mean, it's gotten to the point where, you know, in some COVID leagues they used to do, oh, girls count as two points and boys yeah. count, you know, as one. Well, in a lot of the leagues out here that are COVID, they have now become equal opportunity scoring situations because the women can ball out. And you're, you're sitting up there and you might, it's like, okay, four girl goals and you're never coming back <laughs> your girls can't score, you know? So it's one of those situations where you just have to know your worth and, you know, without it just saying, hey, we're a women's league. No, we're a soccer league that wants mm -hmm. that we're less competitive. We have the money or we're a soccer league, period. We're ready to take this space. Well, yeah, no, I Kelly, hear you, Kelly. Yeah. I just, sorry. And I just. No, no, go ahead. But I do want to come back because you just said yeah. something on fire. Yeah. I want to come back to. Go ahead, Angel. Um, so uh, first, just I wanted to mention that Sue in the chat said, just for those of you. She did start a walking soccer, walking soccer in Seattle with 12 women. And she said it, the word spread. So I think she's encouraging all of us or anybody listening, go ahead and try something, like do it. It um, is fun. You know? It is very fun. Try it. it. Is um, fun. And then, um, and then there was her. a question. Kudos to, kudos to Sue. Um, and then there was a question about um, bringing, we've talked a lot about, you know, making sure that there's space for aging players in different divisions. We started in over 30, over 50 division in the summer. Um, I've heard walking soccer and different opportunities, but, you know, even before COVID, we were, we were kind of thinking, how are we going to retain younger players and actually get attain younger players? There's so many small sided leagues. There's a lot of young professionals where we are, um, you know, that they can just go and play a quick 40 minute game co-ed and then, and then that's their soccer. Um, so we, as a league are trying to figure out how to bring younger players in. Um, and also this question was posed. How, how do you guys uh, attain and retain your younger players? Well, Angela, I wanna, the thing I want to come back to, you actually kind of just <laughs> teed up perfectly as well, like all praise to the moderator. Right. I think all of this to me, there's two things I wanna say, and they both have to do with age and money um, and they go together, which is this, we just need to normalize 
being a female athlete and a league that has money. Like I'm sort of so over this, like, oh my gosh, I get it all the time. I'm a really assertive person. People talk to me like, wow, you're so assertive and shocked. And like, what did you expect? Like, let's put all of your expectations on the shelf and set them aside. And I think we as women players and as leagues, we can just stop apologizing, stop qualifying, all of it. And Callie, your point about money, I mean, our league is incredibly professionally run. It's a testament to the board that's been built up for years. We're not looking for a handout. We'll pay our fees. We'll pay better. Our teams are better organized. They're better behaved. They have proper uniforms. You know, if you want a quality experience, demand quality and have your players do that and don't make excuses. So I just want to say, like, to me, it's all about the economy of sport and the fact that if you can, if you can grow the game at this level, there are millions of recreational women that you could tap into, which gets me to the other point about normalizing and getting younger players in the pipeline. If we can normalize the concept that you play recreational sport because it's fun, it's healthy, it's competitive, gets you out of the house, whatever, again, back to the psychology of why do people play? Because they're an advocate, they wanna travel, they wanna to go to Norway with Brandy, whatever gets you going, tap into that and show younger girls that just because you might finish high school and maybe you play college, like maybe if you're lucky and you do play college, or maybe if you're super lucky, my God, you might play at a higher level than that. But most people won't do that. I think what we've done is we've undervalued the importance of recreational sport for women in all sports, not just soccer, although I do think soccer is the best, all sports, right? That it's okay to keep playing. And there's actually an economy to that. And I think what's interesting to me is the number of young women who play gonzo soccer until high school, and then they quit. And then all of a sudden, you know, the thing that defined their identity they, they give it up. And it's like, and my response to that is like, why are you giving that up? Nobody says you had to do that. And you could keep playing for whatever reason floats your boat. To me, it's all about just normalizing the experience. And that when, and you know, I have, I have a daughter, she's nine. She will take nothing from no one, including me, God bless her. But her psychology is totally different. And this is where you have to talk about title nine is that women today have had different layers of sort of um, involvement in sport, coaches in sport. Um, my friend, Sarah Dwyer Schick, who is the founder of the Sports Bra Project. I know she's here. She's also an amazing coach. Let me give Sarah a shout out. You know, but we talk a lot about normalizing women coaches, not only of women, but of boys too, but even still as player, you know, I coach, I coach my girls, I coach my boys. Everyone freaks out like, oh my God, the mom's coaching. I'm like, why? Like, why? So that needs to be part of it and it needs to be part of the explicit conversation that we say to girls coming through the ranks you can keep playing sports your whole life don't ever let anyone take that from you and then as women we organize these powerhouse leagues that take ourselves seriously give a range of opportunity and if you build it that way i mean it's a huge economy we could tap into and i just think it's all about the framework and if girls today at age nine, start having more and more female coaches. They start seeing their mothers and their grandmothers and their great grandmothers playing walking soccer. You know, what a dream that would be if you could have three or four generations of women on the field together. That, that to me is what success looks like. And you know what? That's worth money. And we need to position it that way and stop making excuses or apologies. So, yeah, that's, that's your point. No, so well said. That you just you hit, you hit something that we sincerely advocate in our league, um, coaching, and it's so it's so cool to see. And this is one of the things that we encourage women. If there's leagues out there, youth leagues that need you know female coaches, I I send out emails to the entire to everyone, and we've had we have a lot of women you know coaches, obviously women, a lot of coaches in our league. The really cool thing though is when they'll run out, they might coach a game at 10 a.m. And then they have a game at three and we see all those girls on our sidelines. And, you know, obviously during COVID, we didn't see it this season, but last fall, seeing all those girls outside out there cheering and to your point, they are, they just had a coach. She just coached them to a win, victory, you know, win, loss, whatever. And now they're out there watching her play, you know, no matter what her age is, some are in masters. So she might be 50, she might be 60. She's still out there. They're supporting her now. And these are, they, the age uh, group of these young ladies can get to your point, like nine, 15, they're teenagers, they're youth, but they're out there and they're seeing us, they're seeing the cycle. You, you're not going to stop. You can keep playing. You can keep doing this. Your coach has came out here, 
and you're like, and they're like, oh, and they're always surprised to see the skill set. Even if you're a wreck or whatever, they're just so in awe to see that it's still happening. That some of these women, their skill sets here, or that oh, she's faster than I thought, or you know, and they're it's so I love it because they're cheering you on. But that's the buy-in. That's yeah. telling me I can keep playing as long as my my feet and my legs let me, and to well, everybody. I can keep doing what I'm walking. <laughs> well, and to, and to some reason, that's why our league has resisted grouping by age. Because I'll tell you, some of the best players in our league are silver foxes, right? And yes. I'm not a great player, but I'm in really good shape. And I love it when I beat my 20-year-old opponent to the corner and keep the ball in. That's praise. But there's a woman on our team that we play. She was the oldest player on our team. And she's, you know, 57, 58 maybe now. Um, if she's listening or watches later, Sue Wing, I'll just give her some credit. She's by far one of our best players and she's also our oldest player and also our most ferocious and i'll tell a funny story that she'll love that you just to talk about age of competitiveness because it proves the point sue had a foul she got to take the free kick and uh the opposing player wasn't giving her you know proper yardage so the ref's like you gotta back up you gotta back up and she's like yeah that's fine i don't care Sue took the kick. She kicked it directly at that girl, like straight at her, like an attack. Somebody else is like, why did you do that? Da, da, da. And Sue's response was like, I just wanted to tell her to back off. And I was just like, I love the story. We lost the ball, but Sue made her point. And you know what? People didn't mess with her. And it was, it was just a great example of like, don't assume anything about someone because of their age or their ability. Like, Again, just break all the boxes. So I hope Sue doesn't mind me telling that story, but it's a sure good one. I wouldn't mess with her on the corner. No, of course. No, As we get older, we start to play again. smarter and not harder. <laughs> so one of the questions in the chat was about bringing bringing different ages into tournaments. And I know, I know, so I know, Brandy, you do tournaments. Callie, you mentioned it. Uh, we do a fundraiser tournament every year. Um, and we actually allow, it's great when you're talking about Anna about seeing different generations. That's one of the times where we will see, you know, all different ages from 16, um, you know, put some 16 year olds all the way up to, you know, like 68 and it's beautiful. Um, so the question that was asked was, you know, what age do you have to be to play in, this, in the tournament? But can you guys tell us a little bit about your tournaments and uh, how they're divided and when, when you have them? I can speak to, all tournaments around the world, uh, mainly because again, I spend my time, my free time putting together this list that I have on my website and it includes links, but I have it by age division. So the, the only ages I leave off are under 30 because I think in general, that's the most available, the easiest to find online. Uh, and, and all of these tournaments that I have listed are ages 30. So what we usually see are like 10 year, um, there's a big tournament in Las Vegas that has you know several, several events throughout the year called Friendship Cup. Um, that's really well known. Uh, we also have USASA, US Adult Soccer Association has a national tournament that's both men and women. So for those larger tournaments, we see starting easily at age 30. So we have 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, from there, you may see 55s. Otherwise you see 60, 65, and then up to age 70. And, and that's true also for the Masters Games, again, an international event that happens every few years, depending if it's the European version or the, the um, kind of Pan-Asian area or whether it's the, the main one, that, that tends to be in, in five-year increments, but we don't have enough representation of women's soccer to, to go into those older ages in general for those. So, so you can see tournaments that are just like 30s and 40s, and that's it, if they have enough population in the area or enough people travel. But I think what we see for our largest tournaments are these nice 10 year, and even within, you know, within the 30s and the 40s, sometimes into the 50s, you'll see level divisions even within those age groups. So there are enough teams nationally, and, and I'll include Canada because, you know, it's not talked about enough, but Canada, when you look at the international masters games, who has been traveling to play in women's soccer, um, that in that sport specifically around the world, Canadian teams have represented Australia and Canada over and over um, throughout the years. So. We do see, especially for the states um, up toward the border, that a lot of Canadian teams will come down easily to these tournaments, and then um, sometimes our U.S. teams will travel. We also have the Senior Games, which there's a national organization of Senior Games that actually doesn't have women's soccer, but the games that feed into it in every state, um, and there's multiple, usually multiple locations of Senior Games for each state, those will often have women's soccer, and that's usually age 50 and over uh, specifically, and then again, like you know, we just see women travel all over the country to play and a lot of the same teams, they may mix and match for tournament teams, but a lot of these women uh, have gotten to know each other over the years. 
Nice. Thank you, Brandy. After we'll definitely forward all the links. So Brandy would love to have your links so, so people can sign up on Facebook and sign up for and, and add their tournaments to your listing. Um, definitely we'll share out women in soccer.org. Um, Cause I think there's a ton of resources and I'm going to propose that we start, that we think about or meet about doing a national tournament for, for the leagues, for the women leagues and groups. As and groups. that just requires communication. So that's the big thing, Angela, like, again, everybody on this call, if you know, another league that is, you know, not, that doesn't seem to already be connected to everyone else, then let them know. We have some huge, like women, the women in Wisconsin, there's women in Iowa, like there are organizations that are huge, but for some reason we don't all know about each other. I'm in contact with teams in Houston and in Portland, um, parts of Florida. They're, they're all out there, but whatever we know, um, you know, everyone just reach out and make sure we all have the same information to connect yeah. because that's what it's gonna take. We can plan the most amazing tournament ever, but unless we can make sure everyone knows about it, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna do what we want it to do. You're right, Correct. even, in, even in the Bay, we have, um, I would say that to your point, I would say we even need to do that locally because, right. you know, we'll t I'll talk to soccer players all the time and, and off of, outside of GGWSL and they won't have known. We've been around since 1977, you know, there's mm -hmm. a thousand players exactly. and, and we're like, well, how can you not know? We're in the Bay, we do so much work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think well, to Anna's point too, like not taking, um, like not giving platforms, you know, and we're all volunteers. So, you know, we can't, we're trying to market. And so we have exactly. to figure out how we do that locally and then spread the word nationally and any well, help. And is, what, I would, what I would say too is an important strategic logistics kind of thing to that is recognize that some people are really organized and will travel as a team. So again, using our league as an example, our mass spirit team has multiple divisions, over 30, over 40, over 50. They're hyper organized and they like to go places as a group. However, there is a geographic limitation to that. So depending on where you are, I think the structure of the tournament could be made where there are other people that maybe they're one of three and their whole team won't go, or maybe they can't go. Cause you know what? It costs money to travel and you got to get the time off and blah, blah, blah. So I think as we look to build these networking opportunities, have it be yes, a whole team, or maybe as an individual, and then you add on to people. And then, you know, I've made friends playing at different tournaments. You know, I connected with Equal Playing Field in France and recruited different people. And then a friend of mine's sister who lives in Chicago joined our team. And so remember that there's sort of, um, I don't say randomized people, but there's this beautiful network of women all across the country now. And we sometimes come as a team and we sometimes come in twos or threes. And sometimes it's just like seeds a party of one, you know, I want to go do something like Brandy was really great. I played on her global goals world cup team in New York last year. And, you know, it was inspirational, but you know, she had some, so I think um, as we develop both national ideas, but also regional ideas, make space for people to come as they are in groups and also recognize like you got to make it fun if someone's going to blow four thousand dollars traveling make it make it an event make it learning make it a party you know and recognize that instead of maybe you know a girls weekend away to vegas where you just lose money and go drinking like you could a lot of people now are taking soccer or sport as their their weekend away i have a really good friend that she gets a little bit of time off and she wants to go play soccer and so she's become one of my travel buddies be like, Hey, let's, let's go do this. So I think it's all structural, right? It's just, and I think that's where our associations have failed. You know, the, the adult soccer associations in general, like that it really, when I see tournaments around the world that involve, yeah, there's these social gatherings, there's music at the field, there's all different types of food to purchase, right? Like it looks like somebody's made an effort to give give these these players an amazing, memorable experience. Photography, videography, right? Like all of it is really memorable. And I find out here in the United States, just in comparison, that that's the failure we're seeing is the credibility concept. Like the amount of effort being put in is so limited that I think if we're going to take ourselves seriously, you know, we're going to need bigger organizations to do the same. Well, I think, you know, to both your points, you're absolutely right. And we have to look at how women travel. I mean, you know, I've, I know tons of women in my league love to travel. I'm one of them. But at the end of the day, when you look at the tournament, sometimes they're not, I want to say women friendly because, you know, lots of men, let's just keep it honest. A lot of men can just get up and be like, okay, well, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. And is never at, thought about what's gonna happen with the kids or he doesn't think about what, how that schedule is gonna change. He's just getting up, he's buying his ticket and he's gone. With women, we're different. Who's watching that? Who is coming with us? Is the tournament kid friendly? Will they have this, where they have that? And I think 
tournaments, even women, we should start, they should start to look at that. Do you have a situation where, because in, you know, if you look at the financial aspect of it, if this is her only vacation, is it going to be a family vacation? Is it something that's worth it? Is she have to bring the kids and is, you know, what can she do with the kids? Lots of women would travel if, if it was kid friendly, if she, she has to bring the kids, they want to play, they can't help it. And they enjoy being around their kids but at the same time. Can we make it so they can do it? Because it's a social thing. You want to go out with your girlfriends. And if your girlfriends, I mean, we've had, I've had uh, people on my teams where they lease houses or rent houses or whatever, and they're all the kids are together. I mean, my son used to make a killing. I would bring him and wouldn't even see him. He would just live in a room at the hotel and he would just make a killing on babysitting services. And matter of fact, I need to see how much money is in that account. But <laughs> killing, I mean, but it was something that we would offer. And I just offered as, you know, a league president, don't worry about it. He'll be there. He can watch your kids, so on and so forth. You want to go out to drinks with your girlfriends. But that's not something that's really offered. And it's unfortunate, but it is, it is something that we have to look at. I mean, at the end of the day, we are normally the caregivers. I mean, I, I hate to make it sound that way, but we usually are. And but it doesn't say we don't want to travel. And it's not to say that we don't have the finances to travel. But to your point, we have to make it worthwhile. Is it something that my husband and kids can go off and do something? Is it a, a destination where they have things to do? Or is it in, you know, po Boken, you know, country hay yard, USA, where you take 15 <laughs> planes are, and a wagon to get right, there? Right. Yeah, you know, it, this doesn't even make any sense. Why are we spending, you know, if all your money is going to travel fees just to get to the tournament, then it's not worth going to the tournament. And I want to add to that, I think we're about out of time, but I do want to say that, you know, what I see internationally is, yeah, these tournaments exist, but women's divisions are add-ons to the men's divisions. Like we might just get thrown in and they kind of put out there like, well, if we get some women's teams to sign up, then we'll give them some field space. And, and I think that I'm working with two women in Cadiz area in Southern Spain on creating a brand new tent tournament for women age 40 plus 50 plus, and then we're going to do friendlies, international friendlies for 60 and older. And even beginners in their 50s, um, really even over 30, beginners kind of mixed in with the, the older experience, 60s and 70s. And, and part of that is we're doing it at a resort. The fields are right, you know, they're professional fields at the resort. And so people can bring families, you know, you can, you can have a family experience, but you don't have to be in the same space all the time, right? You can be out at the field, the family can be at the, the water playground, they can be out touring. So it's a little bit of both where you're offering that vacation experience, but also the focus of it is really to, to meet women internationally who have the same passion as you do, play competitively, have you know this, this, again, memorable experience playing soccer, but it's just for women, it's planned by women, that's our focus. There aren't gonna be any trophy women, you know, barely dressed on the side to present the awards, which I see again in these men's tournament, that the sexism, we're tired of it, um, you know, incorporate the racism, the ageism, everything needs to be filtered out so that women have an opportunity to play with their own freedom, their own competitiveness and, and being part of the community. Yeah, well, that's it. And I, um, I, we are, I just want to respect everybody's time. We are a little bit after 12, we can go a couple more minutes. That would be fine if you have to leave. It looks like some people are saying goodbye. In the chat, I think Dear Jawoli just said a goodbye to you, Anna. That's, <laughs> that's, that's Dee. She's our yeah. Okay. She's our she's our board president. She's amazing. So <laughs> she's um, like, thanks. Um, but I, I just want to quickly say too, like for the as you said, lots of women go, um, and we've had folks who go together and make you know make vacations of the World Cups, and um, and that's and it's all beautiful. And if you can afford to do that, you know, as organizers, like we should definitely try and put that out there. We will. Um, you know, just getting people access to the game to be able to play, right? That's our, that is our number one goal, getting women, yes. all shapes, well, sizes, whatever, out there to play is our number one goal. And, and not to focus on the problem, um, like you said, Brandy, that, you know, it's unfortunate that the, the organizers, the higher USASA, I'm just going to say it, like, they have a great opportunity to help us come together um, but we're going to do that right now ourselves. Like exactly. Soccer exactly. through Brandy's yeah. well, you know, We're doing that ourselves. And right. as women, we're going to organize the women. And I think we know a leadership in most of those associations is primarily men. And, and they have their place. And they do amazing work in the ways that they do it. But certainly, we all have the capability on our own. And, and we ask the right questions to know what we need. Yeah. Well, and the point I wanted to make, and I think it's really important, you know, again, the economy of it, that 
this is a huge market and it's largely untapped. And Angela, to your point, it's not always about the big ticket things. Look for regional opportunities. Like our league has done a lot of partnerships with local leagues, local charitable things. We've partnered up with men's leagues and our things like, you know, look for the, again, local, a little bit bigger, do that. The other thing too, and you know, just, you can't undersell the importance of Title IX that this floodgate is coming, right? So if you think about the, the timeline, the chronology, women in their forties and fifties, fifties and sixties, you know, was really the first generation of women for whom Title IX make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. You think about the tidal waves of women and players coming after, and they want somewhere to play. Like I said, it's coming. And so, you know, the things that were part of my my grandmother's experience my mother wouldn't have tolerated the things that I tolerated my nine-year-old has no concept so we as women have to build an economy for them and we have to provide that opportunity and look to the allied men you know one of the things I like about the women in soccer platform is they have opportunities for the good allies you know I don't want to throw all the men under the bus there are some really yeah. good ones out there too so we have to look for these bridges to me it's just normalizing it people play sports, women play sports, girls play sports, everyone plays sports because sports and, are And that awesome. it's very separate from being a soccer mom, right? That we wanna remove that identity of motherhood because women who play soccer, not only do you not have to be straight, you do not have to have children, you do not have to be necessarily a citizen of the of the country that you're in. I mean, we all have identities that are in question in all different ways um, between you know government policy and regional policy. And I think that inc inclusiveness is what's so important too, that, that we recognize e even as far as gender identity goes, that there's so much opportunity to be inclusive um, within sport that I think we really have to embrace that. Yes. Well, I think, so, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us be a part of this. I mean, I hope that we can continue to help each other grow the leagues. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to everyone's point that all women know that there is a place for them to play soccer. And, and you know, more importantly, not just more importantly, but, you know, for those who came on here to listen, you know, for whatever feedback or whatever advice or anything that we could possibly give you, it is important to continue to make sure these women's leagues are sustained and that they do grow and that they do well and that we continue to network and communicate um, with each other. And to Anna's point, you know, use all the resources, male, female, whatever, there are lots of men out there that are you know, really, really good, but continue for those of us, to, you know, try to break those barriers and to um, make sure they're not only, you know, hearing us, but listening <laughs> to what we're saying and then making things happen. So I am so grateful that you guys allowed me to be a part of this. Hopefully, you know, if anyone has any questions afterwards or anything along the lines of that, you can get yeah. all my information from Brandy, because Brandy's the one who can Brandy, who was like, Callie, so you could be on. I'm like, and we'll forward all the information to all the attendees. <laughs> yeah. We're going to send out the links. Um, definitely join us tomorrow. Hopefully everybody's going to be at the Women in Soccer and all the other ones. Before we wrap up, though, I want to just very quickly um, get your quick response on um, what action you want people to take. We want to amplify, right, what we're doing. We want people to take <clears throat> action. So tell us one thing that, one thing personally you want to see happen in the world of women's soccer in the next five to 10 years, and one action that people can do right now um, to whatever whatever goal you're you're looking to have, to attain. Callie, why don't we start off with you? Oh, because <laughs> like, I have my thought cap on. Um, I think most important for me is um, communication. I just really want to make sure that everyone continues to communicate. I'm only week right now because of COVID, it's going on, and you know every state's not like ours, and you can't get out there and play. But as we discussed, you know, making sure that you keep those relationships with those women that you've. Um, built, you know, on the field that you continue to keep those up. I want to see those thrive. And I want to see women get out there and play. I don't care what your skill set is. I don't care if you have a limp leg. I don't care if your right toe hurts. Get out there. And if, if you're embarrassed, if you've never played a day in your life, you love the game. The game will love you. And that's all I really want to see. Just an increase in communications and to see women out there playing. Awesome. Thanks, Callie. Brandy. I really just want to see our network uh, just merge. I want all these women's leagues really around the world, not just, and a yes. shout out to Elizabeth in Peru, who's been following me for a while. And we've talked about how she can start inviting women of older ages there in Peru. And, and, and again, internationally, I really want to see that there is this communication that Callie's talking about. I mean, it goes down to the fine tuned level of like, which app do we use to communicate with our teammates? Like that still doesn't work for us, right? And then up to the way bigger picture of how internationally 
can we just make sure there's there's good communication and in what we're all doing, giving each other feedback? How do we grow this opportunity in general? Cool. Thanks, Brandy. Anna, take us home. Oh man, the pressure. Um, okay, the thing I want is something we touched on. I want women athletes of all ages and abilities to be normalized as players, coaches, as business people everywhere. So I, I think that's what I want. And I think everything we're doing is headed towards that. I think that my action item is related to that, which is consider this a personal call to action. And I like to use the term in my own life about being an everyday activist. <laughs> Don't wait for some awesome America scores thing to happen or some other league to someone else. Like recognize your own agency in your own life. If you live in a place and you do a comprehensive Google search and you recognize, I don't think there's a league, start your league. If you are uncomfortable with the all male boardroom of your kids' youth leagues, ask to be on the board, you know? I would encourage people to not wait for others to solve a problem, but look for, small incremental little things you can do in your everyday life and those are the things that normalize right I mean I, I sit on a lot of different boards I do a lot of different advocacy and it's not about monumental things it's not always about the world cup it's about changing you know sport fee policies at your local high school level for example you know there are these little sneaky things that you can touch on so my call to action is if it's not there build it and don't be afraid to just look for the small things every day. And if we do that, we will normalize what it looks like to be a, a women player um, coach in every aspect of our life. And when we do that, kumbaya, the world is a better place. <laughs> There's your kumbaya, Anna. <laughs> That's okay to be kumbaya now. So um, sorry for the noise and my, the, my kids are uh, doing their homeschool. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. You guys, please stay tuned because there are some phenomenal sessions coming up. Um, we have Nicole Hercules and Lindsay Kaufman, our very own Lindsay Kaufman from, from the Bay Area here, who does uh, FAGU, um, Bay Area Girls Unite, incredible girls programs. Um, Nicole is a, a, a role model, so, such, such incredible things to share with us, so stay tuned. Um, one thing I just want to say is that when we hear the professional athletes speaking and we hear every other woman in the game in some other way, whether it's the sand soccer ones who spoke uh, on a first day, like the themes are so reoccurring, right? But, you know, like success is one step at a time, like soccer is, a, is for mental health. Um, you know, like there's no such thing as perfect, you know, um, build your confidence from Casey. It, it's incredible what we're hearing and the themes, no matter where you play, no matter what you do in the game, women in soccer are so powerful. So thank you, powerful women for being on today. Join us and doing what you do. And we hope to see you next time from yeah. America scores. See you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome session. You guys. Thank you. Yay. We'll be Can't in wait touch. To you later. We'll be in touch. <laughs>